In my opinion, double jeopardy should have attached, and this case should have been over. Well, Jennifer, this is a weird situation. We have a crime from the 90s here. There's a lot of problems with trying that. So what does the prosecution have to do this third time around? And I know it's not the same team that was always there, but this is the, we're talking about the state trying the same kind of case with the same kind of facts. What do they need to do? Right. Well, the state certainly is going to face challenges with the passage of time. Um, witnesses die. Evidence um, is sometimes no longer available um, when this much time has passed. Uh, memories fade. Um, in this case, though, the prosecution is going to face the challenge of those 77 some additional reports that um, so called material, potentially exculpatory evidence uh, that we now know is going to come into evidence and be presented by the defense. So uh, the prosecution's main challenge is going to uh, to be go to go up against those some reports. Yeah, and let's see how they did. So um, Jennifer Schuster, Mike Corbanix, we're going to wait. Uh, we're going to get your analysis because I want to begin right now with the prosecution's opening statement. So if you missed it, we are going to be live today. Don't forget, we are going to be live in that courtroom today. But yesterday was day one. So in case you missed it, here are some of the prosecution's opening statement, and we'll talk about it after. Okay, that was the prosecution delivering their opening statement in the Stanley Liggins case. We will be live in that courtroom a little bit later on today, and as soon as we get the feed, we'll jump there. But we have so much to talk about, as you can tell. And, Mike, my question to you is, we've been talking so much this morning about, you know, this is his third case. It's been so many years. Is it fair? But we can't forget the fact that he was convicted two times, two separate juries. So there's obviously something the prosecution has that's very strong against this guy, right? Well, I, I, I disagree with you because he was convicted by two juries and his defense wasn't given 77 reports that affected the credibility of all these witnesses they're speaking about that could cast some doubt, quite frankly, some reasonable doubt as to whether or not what they saw was what they saw, was it accurate, and was it proof beyond the reasonable doubt. Whether he did it or not in the courtroom are two different things. Because in the courtroom, he only did it if they have proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay, so Jennifer, he, Mike makes a great point. If maybe this, the prosecution explained that they had a paid informant and that they did deliver the proper records and that they, they did act fairly, would we have had a different result? Maybe that's what the court would say, the, the, Supreme, the Iowa Supreme Court. But I'm asking you, all right, what do you think, really? If you take all that away, do you think the prosecution still has a very strong case against this guy? I think it's quite possible. I mean, we'll have to hear exactly what's in those those 77 reports, um, because that can be an absolute game changer. The Iowa Court of Appeals said that that was material, potentially exculpatory evidence. Um, and the standard by which they determine if something is material is, uh, do they have confidence in that verdict? In other words, uh, would that verdict possibly be different if that evidence was admitted in the trial? Um, so to that end, I, I do believe um, that this could be an entirely different verdict uh, in light of this new evidence that will come in. And Mike, we have about a minute. I got to ask you this question. The defense didn't put on an opening statement. Why? That's unusual. I, I, that has, that's a call by the person who's defending him. But I don't think that's ever a good idea because now all they have is the prosecution story. You should at least remind them of the standards they're held to and what you are going to do in your defense. See, part of this, too, is the cross-examination part of it is. Without those documents, to cross, the, the most effective thing an advocate has is cross-examination. Right. And that's, you should at least tell the jury what you're going to show through your cross-examination so they're queued up as to what to hear. Well, we'll have to see what their strategy ultimately is. And when we come back, we're going to start with some testimony. You came at a perfect time. We're just starting to talk about this case. And today, when we go live, day two in the Stanley Liggins case. We'll be back. There was a fire, and it shouldn't have been there. That's exactly right, because those were the burned remains of a nine-year-old girl named Jennifer Ann Lewis. And the question is, did Stanley Liggins, the defendant, do it? We have to talk about it. Joining me back again is criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Mike Korbonix. And Mike, I got to ask you about this. We were talking a little bit about it in the break. Um, the idea that, you know, evidence was collected 30 years ago uh, to try to find out what happened to this young girl. It's alleged that Liggins raped her, strangled her, put her body in a plastic bag, and set her on fire. 
the way it's collected 30 years ago being used now, do you see any issues with that? How does that even work? Well, I'm, I'm a little confused because <clears throat> we saw the opening, although uh, we didn't see what the whole opening is. You know, we have allegations of sexual assault. You know, there's rape kits. It's just amazing to me, and I would think we would have seen it. I mean, if you're the prosecutor, the first thing you would say is, we have evidence of a rape, we have DNA. Everybody talks about DNA. And even if they collected it 30 years ago and the technology wasn't the same as it is today, you could always go back and retest. So that's a puzzle, that a piece of the puzzle, that I really am not sure where these allegations are coming, because you would think that would tie Liggins to the case, and that would be a true game changer. I'm here also with attorney Jennifer Schuster. As Mike said, is that something that the defense will be ample to jump on, that they really want to jump on that? I mean, the, the longer a crime, I would imagine, the longer a crime uh, occurred to the trial, the better it is for a defense attorney, correct? Oh, yeah, absolutely. With the passage of time, um, certainly uh, evidence can go missing, uh, memories fade, uh, and we've heard already that some of these witnesses are dead. Um, but I think that the prosecution is zeroing in on the fact that uh, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence in this case. Um, I did, in fact, listen to the, to the whole opening, um, and I know that the prosecutor tried to make that distinction uh, to the jury, saying that circumstantial evidence is no less reliable um, than direct evidence. At least that's their position. So they're heavily relying on a lot of these eyewitnesses um, who saw Liggins and saw Jennifer um, but the challenge, I think, will be, uh, was there a witness who really saw them together in close proximity to the crime? Jennifer, Mike, you guys are breaking down really the fascinating aspects of this case. And I want to continue on because when I get back, I'm going to, I want to play you, well, first I'm going to go to a clip. But when I come back, I want to ask both of you about the fact that this jury knows about that this man was tried two separate times. They don't know the verdicts. They don't know the sentencing. But they know that this is his third time on trial, and we're going to ask both of you guys about that. But first, I want to play the testimony. It's a transcript, excuse me, of Earl Osterberg. He, is from the Dav he was from the Davenport Fire Department. This is the person who found the fire and talked about putting it out. Let's play that transcript right now. That was the transcript of Earl Osterberg from the Davenport Fire Department being read. You heard it. It's a little strange. I don't know if we've ever done that here on Law and Crime. We've had previous tape depositions and tape testimony, but this is a little different, I am assuming, based upon what we heard in the prosecution's opening statement, that this witness is unavailable because he may, have been de he may be deceased. Um, but uh, as you can clearly tell, he is not available. Um, Mike, weird to see this, but the jury is seeing this. Don't they lose a little something from having that transcript as opposed to having a witness actually there? You lose a lot, I think. <laughs> it's, it, as you saw, it looks like they're auditioning for a play. Right. Somebody's reading the questions. This officer has nothing to do with the investigation. He has nothing to add. There's going to be no interaction between any of the people giving questions and the witness. And I think a jury sometimes, especially in a case like this, because this is going to be relatively long and there's a lot of small witnesses, little pieces together, that these may be the parts where you zone out, and that's always a danger. Yeah, I mean, look, it's not easy being on this jury, and Jennifer, uh, this is a really tricky case for them, but one of the most interesting aspects is they, were, they know, they were told that this is the third trial for this man. They don't know what his, that he, the verdict in the prior two cases, they don't know what his sentence was, but they know this is his third time. These are human beings. What are they thinking about sitting on this jury for a man who's getting tried for a third time? Yeah, I think it's irrelevant that they don't know what the verdicts were. I think a juror is likely sitting there and saying, uh, regardless of what the outcome was, obviously it's still unresolved because we're all still sitting here. Um, so to that end, I think they're probably thinking there's something fundamentally wrong with the state's case. Um, so I think uh, it likely will weigh on a juror in that way, um, although they'll be expressly directed not to consider that. Um, I think it's inevitable because they're human that they may uh, draw that conclusion that there's something fundamentally flawed with the state's case, um, especially considering the passage of time. Um, like you were discussing earlier, we've got this witness reading a transcript. Um, it all looks kind of funny and kind of odd that we're still here after all of this time. Yeah, and if you're sitting on that jury, you're 
you don't know what to make of it. You're now sitting in a murder trial that didn't happen a year ago, didn't happen two years ago, happened almost 30 years ago in trying to make sense of why this happened. Mostly here on Law and Crime, we see these cases when new evidence is collected and a suspect is finally arrested in a case, those cold cases that then heat up. This is very strange, but as Jennifer said, she saw a guy who got tried six times, so three times, it's nowhere near that. But when we come back, we have a lot more to discuss in this case. We'll be right back. And welcome back, everybody. We're talking about the Stanley Liggins case out of Iowa. Now, we have a live feed into the courtroom. I want to show it right now. Not a lot is happening. They're getting set up for the trial for today. This is going to be day two. You're starting this case really at a great time, right at the beginning. We played a little bit of the prosecution's opening statement. The defense, <clears throat> excuse me, didn't put on an opening statement yet. They reserved that right. We played you the testimony of some individuals. And now I want to talk about why are we here? Why are we here? Let's go back. This man, Stanley Liggins, this is his third time on trial. His previous two convictions were overturned. And let's try to understand why. So, Mike, his first conviction, uh, he was found guilty in 1993, but that was overturned because the court, the highest uh, Iowa Supreme Court said that not only did jurors improperly hear evidence that uh, Liggins sold cocaine, but the prosecution didn't even prove that this crime happened in Iowa. What? How did this happen? Th that that's pretty unbelievable, and it goes it goes back to what we said earlier. Is the, you know the judge ruled that double jeopardy doesn't apply. Obviously, the judge in the first case didn't get it right. Um, the fact that the, they didn't prove that the case happened in Iowa that's more to me a technicality. That's sort of like a you know everything a judge could have corrected that and let them reopen or let them submit. I mean, everybody knew where the crime was. That was never in dispute. But you have to prove every little detail in a court. That's correct. But, yeah. but on a technical thing like that, a judge will step in and say, you know, rather than causing a problem down the road, let's take care of it. The cocaine, that is, that's a problem, in my opinion. In my opinion, because now you're having the jurors think that this guy has a pro proclivity to commit crimes. Mm -hmm. He's under the influence, he's selling cocaine, and so anything goes for him. He'll do anything. Right. And especially when you have, like, selling cocaine, because now you're talking about somebody who may be under the influence. This seems like something so crazy you'd have to be under the influence to do. There's so many bad inferences a jury can draw that it really has nothing to do with the crime that he's charged with. Well, it gets worse because when he was tried in 1995 and convicted, that conviction was overturned again. And this reason was, and I want to talk to Jennifer Schuster about this, is that the court said that they, uh, the defense didn't know that a key prosecution witness was a paid informant, and the defense didn't obtain 77 police reports. So, Jennifer, what happened here? How did the prosecution do this? I, I can't explain it. I can't understand this. Right. Well, the prosecution actually denied that they failed to turn over those reports, um, and they also said that it wasn't material that this uh, fact that the informant was paid uh, they argued that that wasn't material, and the Court of Appeals found uh, that that wasn't the case. Uh, they appointed a special master that's a, a court-appointed neutral to go through the discovery files, and uh, that person determined uh, that those 77 reports weren't turned over, and the court determined uh, that those reports contained material, potentially exculpatory evidence. Uh, and likewise, the Court of Appeals found that, uh, yeah, it's important for the defense to know that this was a paid police informant, and that fact wasn't disclosed uh, in the second trial or the first trial. Uh, and then 13 years later, after the second conviction, it's reversed by the Iowa Court of Appeals. Wow. <laughs> Pretty incredible stuff. Well, we have our third trial. Hopefully that was all worked out. Now we have a fair, a fair shot at finally trying this guy. And I want to play right now the testimony of Captain David Parrick from the Davenport Fire Department. Remember, uh, Jennifer Lewis's body was set on fire. So let's learn a little bit more about that. Wow. Can you imagine being a firefighter and you report to a scene and you think it's going to be a regular fire and it's somebody whose body was set on fire? It's horrific. Really horrific stuff. Uh, Mike, what is the importance for the prosecution to establish with the fire department that there was a fire and all this? What, what's, what are they really trying to get for the jury here? I mean, uh, I know it's an important fact, but really, why are they doing, why are they starting the case this way? Well, I think it gives them a chron chronology of how this happened. And also, he said something in his testimony that was um, <coughs> pretty important, and it, 
I think what it shows is that when the fire department came on, he said, I, I used a different technique because I knew there was evidence and I didn't want to spray directly and wash things down. So it was more of like a fan out spray. So I think they want to start giving a chronology and also saying that these people are trained and we're bringing you credible trained people and this evidence has been pretty much undisturbed, all things considered. And I think that helps them. Yeah, it wasn't a normal fire, it was arson. And when we get back, we're going to play you the transcript testimony of Captain James Carpenter, the arson investigator. Again, you will see a lot of these times where transcripts are being read because this was a crime that happened 30 years, almost 30 years ago, and sometimes those witnesses are unavailable. So we'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. We're still talking about the murder, murder trial, excuse me, of Stanley Liggins. This man is on trial for the third time for the brutal, brutal sexual assault and murder of a nine-year-old girl named Jennifer Ann Lewis. What you see right there is a live feed into the courtroom. Nothing's happening yet. They're getting set up for the day, but as soon as the trial begins and that jury is called in, guess what? We're going to go there. We're going to go live. But in the meantime, we are recapping some of the testimony from yesterday. And that brings me to the transcript testimony of Captain James Carpenter, the arson investigator. Let's play some of that right now. I know, I know it seems a little strange when you see this, uh, the transcript testimony being read back in a courtroom because that witness is unavailable. You hear how it was, this witness was cross-examined, what the direct ex examination questions were, objections. It's very interesting, but that's just the circumstances of when you have a case and a trial almost 30 years later. That's just what happens. Now, we do have a live feed in the courtroom. Nothing's happening quite yet. As soon as the live feed starts, and as soon as trial starts, we'll make sure to jump back in there. But we have a lot to analyze. And I want to start off again with attorney Jennifer Schuster, who's joining us here uh, via Skype. And Jennifer, this guy, Stanley Liggins, if he was never implicated in the murder of Jennifer Lewis, he would still be in jail for uh, quite some time, correct? That's right. Actually, one month before uh, Jennifer Lewis was killed, uh, Stanley Liggins was accused of sexually assaulting a nine-year-old girl in the Rock Island area. Uh, and Jennifer Lewis, also nine years old, when she was murdered. Uh, and about a year after this alleged incident happened, he was in fact convicted of criminal sexual assault and he was sentenced to seven years in prison. And then while he, when he was in prison, he was also convicted of assaulting uh, another inmate and he was sentenced uh, uh, to three years for that. So yes, in fact, uh, he would have been in prison for uh, quite some time because of those other offenses. Yeah, now the jury probably doesn't know about any of that, and they really shouldn't. But, Mike, my question to you is, and, and this is why this case is so unique, so that we talked about earlier how the jury knows this is his third time on trial. At the same point, do you think they want to garner up some sympathy for him? Like, hey, listen, to the jury, I know you don't know what the verdict was, I don't know what the sentence is, but this has been going on for almost 30 years. This has been a cloud over his head. He's been in prison. Do you b mention that a little bit in the terms of maybe either in the, if the de defense decides to put on an opening statement or in their closing argument, or maybe they even put him on the stand? What do you think? Well, I, I, I don't think this witness, this defendant will ever take the stand in this case because of what we just spoke about on his other convictions, because those would be admissible then, then they'd come in. As far as the jury, this is interesting because I think the jury does know, because this is, you know, people are much more educated about the legal system because of media, things like we're doing here today. They know what's going on. If he was acquitted of those first two trials, of the first trial, there'd be no second trial. There'd be no appeals. The state would have lost. So I think the jury is educated enough, even without being told, that they know he was convicted before and something was wrong with the prosecution. That's why they're here. Because if he was acquitted, you can't appeal an acquittal. Mm -hmm. that's, right. that's clear, undisputed double jeopardy. Right. And I think this jury knows because of places like law and crime, people know about how, how trials work now. So I think there's a problem for the state. I think the state would be more concerned about that than the prosecution. I mean, than the defense, because 
the jury may be saying, why can't the state get this case right? Right. That's it. Now, that's a good point. Jennifer, is that the strongest avenue for the defense to explore, or are there some other avenues uh, that we can go to? Uh, I don't know if we, Jennifer, are you still there? Are you still with us? Great. Yes. I am. So what is the defense's best strategy? Is it to really mention the fact, the passage of time? Is it to try to hit on some of those witnesses whose memory might not be what it used to be? Or is there some other avenue that we just haven't thought of yet? I think the defense is likely to capitalize on the fact that there is uh, mostly circumstantial evidence in this case. Um, and we don't have direct evidence, uh, witnesses placing uh, these two individuals, the victim and the defendant, uh, together in close proximity to the crime. Um, we've heard about these witnesses who saw Jennifer earlier in the day. They saw the car later in the day. Uh, they saw the fire in the car nearby the fire. Um, but I haven't heard anything yet um, that places these two individuals together. Um, and we haven't heard evidence, uh, direct evidence. And I think uh, the prosecution will try to say that circumstantial evidence is just as powerful, but the defendant uh, will argue that uh, that's not the case. Circumstantial evidence is not as reliable. And those circumstantial evidence cases can go one way, they can go another way. It's always so interesting. Now, we have the live feed in the courtroom, so let's dip in a little bit and hear what's going on. The judge is on the bench. Welcome back, everybody. We're talking about the Stanley Liggins case out of Iowa. This is a really fascinating case, and we have an update for you. Yes, we have a live feed into the courtroom, but trial hasn't started yet. But most importantly, we just received old crime scene photos. Uh, they just were sent to our newsroom, and I want to show some of them right now. Remember, this is from back in the 1990. Um, you're looking at them right now. It's a pretty fascinating situation as we circle through them, and you see investigators uh, going there for the first time. It can't, we can't forget the fact that Jennifer Ann Lewis, her burned remains were found. That's what you're hearing from these transcripts, um, uh, from the, these uh, transcripts that are being read in court about from the fire department about what it was like to be there and see the burned remains of this young girl. They didn't know what it, they were responding to, and they were ultimately responding to the burn, to a, a burning. It's a really horrific situation. Uh, Mike, my question to you is, when we talk about a case that's almost 30 years old. And we're trying it now, as opposed to when it was tried back in 1993 and then 1995. How have trials differed? Well, I think what how you have changed. Well, the, I think I could talk about this because that's probably about the time when I started trying cases as a prosecutor, assistant prosecutor. Um, I think they've changed because jurors are much more educated to the system. Um, Thirty years ago, about thereabouts, when you started having court TV, people started watching trials who had nothing to do with the trial. They were watching them because they were entertained by them. They were learning. So I think jurors are a little more astute as to what's going on. And I think lawyers are more in tune when they're presenting their case or defending their case with that in mind. And, and Jennifer, what do you think about that? Is it good or bad for juries to have an understanding of our legal system before they serve their jury duty? Or do they, you want them to have a fresh take? You don't know anything and just follow the judge's instructions of what the attorneys say? Right. Uh, you always want jurors who are open-minded. Um, you know, Mike alluded to how jurors today are, are more educated, um, probably as a result of uh, the CSI effect, uh, programs like this, Court TV. Um, so folks think they know a lot more, but they don't necessarily know a lot more. So I think, uh, you know, to that extent, it can be a detriment. Um, but on the other hand, uh, as long as they're open-minded, that's, that's all that really matters. I just hope they're not currently watching Law and Crime. They can watch it afterwards, but they just can't watch right now. Um, and what we're going to do right now here on our end is we're going to go live into the Stanley Liggins courtroom. The jury is not present, but where there's some preliminary matters uh, where we last left off, there was the transcript of testimony that was going to be read later this morning, and we're trying to see if some parts of it will be taken out, um, what will be left in, what will ultimately be read. It's an interesting case because you're reading the transcript testimony from years ago. Those witnesses are unavailable now. Let's go live. Okay, so let's break this down with Jennifer Schuster. Jennifer, I think what's happening right now is they are looking at the transcripts that will be read in court. A lot of these witnesses aren't available to testify now. I mean, this case was back in the 90s. Um, going through it and cutting out what shouldn't be read and what should be read, something about that doesn't seem right, but what do you think about that? 
Well, the court has to carefully consider the rules of evidence. I mean, generally out of court statements, uh, they're hearsay and they're not subject to cross examination. And so they can't be admitted into evidence. Um, but I think in this case, they're examining transcripts from former trials. Um, and when it's former testimony, uh, in most cases that can be admitted because it was subject to cross examination in the former trial. Um, but there may be bits and pieces for uh, a variety of reasons and a variety of arguments um, that the defense is raising. Um, in which case the uh, judge will determine that that's not admissible. Uh, the judge has a lot of discretion uh, when it comes to rules of evidence and procedure. And Mike, you know, <laughs> I got to ask you from a practical point of view, do you think an attorney looks at the prior transcripts of what other attorneys questioning was and they said, I wouldn't have asked that question. Oh. I wouldn't have done it that way. Absolutely. I mean, everybody's got their own style, their own story they want to tell and how they want to tell it. What I think is most troubling about everything with this test, with these transcripts, is the very fact that we have now a court that said that these transcripts and this cross examination was done without 77 reports. Mm. If I was representing Liggins, based on what I know, I'm not Monday morning quarterbacking. I would be jumping up and down saying, you can't use any of these transcripts or any of these transcripts that dealt with reports I should have had at the second trial. Right. Because this is not now under the rules of evidence where he was subject to cross-examination and direct and under oath because the cross-examination wasn't a thorough cross-examination, and that's been confirmed by the appellate courts. So I think that that's a huge problem, and I just don't see how to get around it on the next appeal. You know, it's funny. It's hard trying any case, and I cover a ton of them here on Law and Crime. We cover a ton of them. It's hard for the prosecution. It's hard for the defense, and it's also hard for the jury as well. But to have a case this old, there are so many different issues, and we have to talk about all of them. So we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, a lot more to discuss in the Stanley Liggett's trial. Okay, so that was Christiana Olson. Let's talk a little bit more about it with criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Mike Korobonix. Uh Mike, question. So we're looking at this. We're hearing the testimony. You can't help but think, how tough is it for witnesses to recount something that happened uh, almost 30 years ago? Yeah. I, 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 it's almost unbelievable because just think about something maybe happened last, last month. I don't remember what happened five minutes ago. I don't know the last question I asked you. Uh, you know. it, it's true. It's, 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 it's very tough. But what I'm sure the prosecution's done in preparation for these witnesses, as I would have done when I was a former prosecutor, um, you, you go to the transcripts, you try to refresh the recollection. But, you know, that's also something that makes a lot of fodder for cross-examination for criminal defense attorneys. Like, you didn't, you weren't remembering this freshly. You, you have to meet with the prosecution. You had, it just is really not a clean trial. No, and every time they try it, every time, the passage of time, the passage of time, it gets harder and harder and harder. We have a new witness on the stand right now, so let's go live into the Stanley Liggins trial. All right, things are taking a little bit of an interesting turn here. We're learning from this witness that both he and the defendant were at the home of Jennifer Lewis, the victim, the night she died, or the day she died. Let's bring back in uh, Jennifer Schuster, an attorney, to talk about this. Um, this is strange. This is a strange development. If you read the court papers, uh, and there's been a lot to read in this case, I'm not sure if he was ever a suspect, Mr. Zapian, but he was right there, right there when this all happened. And we also know that Liggins knew uh, the victim and her family. It's a very strange situation, right? Right. So we know that Liggins was at least an acquaintance of uh, the victim's mom and stepfather. And so I think this witness um, offers the fact that um, they were all there together at the house earlier in the day. And perhaps the defense will raise the argument that uh, this witness was a suspect and they're trying to get ahead of that argument. The prosecution is trying to get ahead of this argument. Um, but I think really the point that the prosecution is trying to make here is very much being eclipsed by the fact that this man clearly has a tremendous lack of memory. I mean, every answer is a big, long pause. He's shifting around in his seat. Uh, do you remember vaguely? Well, it's been a long time. I mean, yeah. I, it's, it's, a, pretty it's, a it's a circumstance of this kind of case, and we're going to see a lot here on the trial. We'll have to take a quick break, but we'll be right back. Stay tuned. 
pretty fascinating stuff listening to Ed Zapian, who was hanging out with the victim and the defendant on the day that that little girl, the victim, died. Uh, we're going to jump back there in a minute. Um, we have to take a break on our end. But in the meantime, I have to sign off for our, our guests. First of all, Jennifer, Sh Jennifer Schuster, thank you so much for joining us. Can't wait to have you back on. Thank you, Jesse. And of course, uh, of Micah Korbanix, thank you so much for coming here as well. My pleasure. Nice being here. Thank you. Of course. Well, we are going to take a quick break. We'll be right back.